Good morning, and welcome to Harmony Grove United Methodist Church here on February 28th, the second Sunday in Lent, for a service today that we are titling Setting Your Mind. We are glad to have you joining us virtually. Uh, we are so delighted that you're able to tune in at this time, and we look forward to those who might uh, look at this later in the week. Uh, just FYI, we will be meeting in person again starting March 14th. And so details have been out in constant contact, and we have other details elsewhere. Uh, but just know that we'll be meeting in person under the same kind of uh, pandemic precautions we had previously. So we look forward to that time. At this time, uh, Gretchen is going to join me for the call to worship, which we will read um, antiphonally. Um, I will be the leader, and Gretchen will lead you as the people in the responses. Pilgrims, we are invited to journey through this season of Lent. Towards the one who calls us each by a new name. Disciples, we walk with Jesus wherever he leads us. Pulling our fears, our doubts, our longings behind us. Believers, we seek to trust the God who always surprises us. Whose promises take on flesh and blood in the good news called Jesus. Let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we invite your presence to be with us now, that your spirit might fill us, that we might indeed worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, we're going to ask that those who want to stand at home, please feel free to stand at home and join us in this opening hymn, which is Come, Christians, Join to Sing. Good morning, Harmony Grove friends and family. Today, I wanna to talk to you about how blessed we are to have such a beautiful stained glass window in our church. Often, stained glass windows tell the story of Jesus's life. Light comes through the windows and makes all of the colors glow.
there's a really special time in the mid-afternoon at our church when the light shines through that window and it shines right on the altar and makes it look like a brilliant rainbow. As you can see, the windows are made of small pieces of colored glass that fit together to form a picture. Have you ever thought about how stained glass windows are made? It's a really difficult process. Working with glass is not only difficult, but it can be dangerous. You must wear special glasses to protect your eyes when working with glass. Many special tools are needed, such as glass cutters, glass grinders, pliers, and soldering irons. Small pieces of glass must be cut to exactly the right size. Sometimes the glass breaks in the wrong place and you have to be careful not to cut your hands. Even though working with stained glass is difficult, it is worth the effort because the end result is a beautiful, inspiring piece of art that causes us to think about God's love. Bible teaches us that following Jesus is a difficult thing to do. Jesus said, whoever wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus warns us that to follow him is like carrying a huge, heavy cross. Even though you choose to follow Jesus, there may be times when you may have difficulty making the right decision and doing the right thing. You may get discouraged, other people might make fun of you, you might even think that it's just too hard to do, but it is worth all of the effort. In much the same way that stained glass is beautiful and inspiring, so too will your life be beautiful and inspiring to others when you show them God's love. Just as light comes gleaming through stained glass, God's light comes from within you, shining out for others to see. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for the light of your love. Help us to shine it for the whole world to see. Amen. Thank you, Gretchen, for that inspiring message. I love stained glass window and the idea that uh, with all that work and effort, we too, in a sense, can be a stained glass window. Uh, we can be a beautiful uh, image uh, of God's grace and love to others if we but set our mind to it and actually work at it. Uh, at this time, we're going to take up our offering, and uh, I want to invite those of you who are at home to please uh, give. That's right. Give online um, or uh, send a check in or feel free to drop a check off here at the church. We continue to remain in need of your funday, uh, money uh, and funding for the church. Also, too, we uh, have an opportunity. You may have seen that in the constant contact. We have an, an anonymous donor who is willing, in a sense, to supplement uh, any increases in giving that you might do uh, that is automatic and online. In other words, 
you go click online and you set it up for a monthly or weekly withdrawal of money, you will be notified of that and any increase in that giving that you might give, this donor will match it by 10% and add that to the, to the gift, so that's great. Also too, I want to make everyone be aware that we are at this time also taking up uh, a, what's called our homeless offering. Uh, this is uh, for the North Georgia United Methodist Housing and Homeless Council. 100% uh, of your uh, offering goes to serving persons, persons experiencing poverty. So we want to prayerfully ask you to consider giving to this. Uh, put on your memo line uh, homeless offering and we will uh, make a note of that and make sure it goes to the right place. But I know that some of us have special burdens for those who are homeless and this is an opportunity for you to support that ministry of the United Methodist Church. Let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a giver of good gifts. All that we have comes from you. Lord God, we pray that you will bless this offering. We pray that you will bless those who are giving and those who will receive it. We pray that you will use it for the building of your kingdom uh, here at Harmony Grove and throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our lay Bible reading for today is taken from the book of Genesis, 17, 1 to 7, and 15 to 16. Please hear these words. The sign of the covenant. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, 
and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. In verses 15 to 16, God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sharon, for that reading uh, from Genesis. At this time, we are going to go to the Lord our God in what we call our pastoral prayer. This is when I lift up the needs of those from among our congregation, our nation. Uh, and also, too, it's a time when the congregation joins me in prayer as we lift up our voices and our hearts to God, knowing that God hears our prayer. So I invite you, as I pray, to be prayerful. Also, too, as the names scroll across the screen of those who are on our uh, prayer list, I ask that you lift them up by name as well. Let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, what a joy it is to draw near to you, to always be in your presence. No matter where we are, you are there. Yet, Lord God, oftentimes we are simply unconscious, unaware that you are with us, that you love us, that you go before us, that you go behind us, that you support us in all we need. Lord God, as we heard this story from Genesis, we are reminded that you are a God who makes covenants with your people and that, Lord God, you have been at work trying to mend sin as it appears in our lives since Eden. And, since Eden. and Lord God, we thank you for the many covenants that you made with Noah and with Abraham and David. And Lord God, the new covenant that came to us through Jesus Christ you have always been there reaching out to us trying to mend that which is broken so that we might find salvation and in that salvation we might find forgiveness of our sins and peace and strength to face whatever troubles come our way and Lord God we know that there are many in our midst who have troubles we pray for them Lord we pray for those who are undergoing medical treatments we pray for those who are having tests that are coming up or that are pending or that are waiting on results. Lord God, we pray for all those who are undergoing various treatments of various sorts, surgeries. And Lord God, we pray for those who might have lost a loved one, who are still grieving the loss of a loved one, comfort them. And Lord God, we especially pray for all those who are suffering from this COVID-19. Be with them, minimize their symptoms, Help them to be safe, to contain that virus, to not spread it. Help us to know that there is light at the end of this tunnel, Lord, and that, Lord, you've provided for us vaccines, uh, a way to provide for the health and wholeness of this whole world. So enable us, strengthen us to take those uh, vaccines that we might find healing for ourselves and for our communities. Lord God, we pray for our nation, for our leaders, that you will inspire in them a sense of justice and compassion and that you will lead them in paths of righteousness uh, that they might be mindful of those who are suffering uh, those who are disempowered those who are marginalized lord god we pray for our leaders throughout the world be with them all lord god we thank you for so much we thank you for this church we pray that you will continue to bless it as it continues to move into the future for lord god we know that you have a future in store not only for Harmony Grove, but for the Methodist Church, for, for the Christian Church, Lord. We know that you are at work in the world. And Lord God, there is so much darkness in this world, so much hate and anger and disparity and inequality and injustice. And so Lord God, we pray that you would instill in your church the knowledge that they are a light unto the world. And they can bring light. They can bring peace. They can bring joy. They can bring a touch that soothes the brokenhearted. Let us not be divisive at each other's throats, but let us be one body in Christ. There is one Lord and one baptism and one faith, 
And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for this church. We pray that you'll bless and be on us as we continue to, uh, as we open up in person here shortly, uh, and hopefully by the fall when we can have everything back to normal, we hope and pray that that will be the case. Bless us all. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Andrew, Gretchen, and Nahi for that beautiful, beautiful song. At this time, I would like to invite those of you who would like to, if you're even at home, to stand uh, as a sign of respect uh, for the reading of the gospel, which today is taken from the gospel, according to Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Hear these words. 
Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit, forfeit their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Last week, as you may recall, um, I spent the time uh, talking about a prayer practice that I was kind of inviting you to partake in, uh, not only during Lent, but hopefully you'll continue to do this after Lent. Uh, the prayer practice was based in part on the temptations to Jesus, uh, but also, too, on 1 John 2.16, where it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And I invited you to take each of those phrases, uh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and to kind of meditate on them in your prayer life, so that you be become more aware of the places where you sin and where you might be in need of forgiveness. And so perhaps, as I said, during Lent, you can use this as part of your daily spiritual practice. Today, however, I want to focus on another type of spiritual practice that you might be able to begin using during this Lent as well. In our Gospel reading for today, it is referred to as setting your mind. The question is whether your mind is set on the things of God or on the things of the world, and whether you have any control whatsoever over this. Now, in Greek, there is one word used for setting your mind, uh, which is sphreneo, which comes from a word indicating the midriff, or diaphragm. So one could say that my sphreneo has grown during the pandemic, my midriff. Uh, but the point being that it somehow connects to what is inside us um, and that it captures an idea of how one's inner perspective corresponds to one's outward behavior. That is, what one thinks or feels is reflected in how one acts. As one commentator noted, this idea is difficult to translate into English because it combines the visceral and cognitive aspects of thinking. So perhaps in the vernacular, one might say it originates in one's gut, as in a gut reaction or a gut instinct. Uh, we all know what these are. Uh, we are faced with a choice, and our gut suggests to us a certain course of action or a response, and then we have to ask ourselves whether we should follow our gut. Now, many of you know that in pop psychology and oftentimes from our well-meaning friends, what do they often tell us? Go with your gut. If your gut says something is right for you, then it is right. If your gut says something is bad for you, then it is bad. Trust your gut, they say, and you will be happy. Which explains why I've dropped a lot of money on a spur-of-the-moment purchase that in the end didn't make me happy but just added more junk for me to carry around. Or when my gut tells me, go ahead and eat that bag of chips, yet I know that all that salt will be bad for me. Just because your gut tells you to do something doesn't always mean it is good. In fact, it could be very bad for you. Like when your gut tells you it'll be fine to have another drink when you know you've already had too many. Or when your gut tells you to buy that pretty little sports car as your family car and you have five kids and a spouse and were sent out to buy a minivan. Sound psychology 
as well as the Bible, suggest that good decision-making uses both one's gut and one's brain. It is not either or, but both and. And sound psychology and the Bible also suggest that one's gut instincts can be sharpened or shaped in some manner. That learning and experience can strengthen our instincts. Think of someone who is a professional baseball player with many years of training and experience. It is more likely that their gut instinct as to whether to swing at a pitch is worth a lot more than mine with no training. The more you cook, the more your instincts will inform you as to what might go with what best. The more you drive, the more your gut will inform you as to whether a given situation is more dangerous than another. The more you play music, the more likely it is you're going to have an instinct as to what goes well, what sounds well together. The more time you spend with your family and friends, the more your gut will tell you if and when they are troubled, if and when they are happy. Well, the same is true for our spiritual practice. The more we spend with God in deepening our relationship and figuring out who God is and what God wants for us, the more our gut will tell us if something is of God or is of the world. This was Peter's problem in our gospel reading for today. Peter had not yet spent enough time with Jesus to know what Jesus might or might not want or what he might or might not do. Therefore, when he heard Jesus talking about how he must suffer and be rejected and die and be resurrected, Peter did not think, but instead responded with his gut, which was telling him that he did not want to lose Jesus and that surely there must be another way for the Messiah to complete his mission. This gut reaction, however, did not come from God or from the Holy Spirit, but instead it came from who Peter is as a human being, a weak, sinful, fearful, and short-sighted human who wants to stay in control of all situations, which pretty much describes all of us, if I am not mistaken. So, was Peter destined to never trust his gut again when it came to the things of God? Are we never able to trust our gut instincts when it comes to the things of God? Absolutely not. But, in order to transform our gut instincts from a focus on ourselves and our own human concerns to a focus on God and God's concerns is going to take work. In fact, it will take a lot of work, perhaps even a lifetime of work. And the work that is involved in this is what separates a mature Christian who can eat the metaphorical meat of the gospel, as Paul says, from the immature Christian who, like an infant, can only drink its milk. So, the question I want to present to you today, that I want to pose for you during this Lent season, is this. Do you want to be a mature Christian, a man or a woman of God, or do you want to remain immature, like a baby, drinking the milk others give to you? If it is the latter, if you just want to stay immature, drinking milk, then it's clear you are a Christian probably only in this for the reward, which is basically to get to heaven, which is fine, I guess. I mean, after all, that is the bottom line, right? Getting to heaven, being saved. You are saved and you are bound for heaven. God still loves you. Who am I to judge? But I'll tell you this. You are missing out on what it means to be a follower of Christ, to be sanctified in Christ, as we Methodists are fond of saying. You are stuck in the door, as it were, when there lies before you a vast and beautiful landscape that is yours to explore and to discover as a child of God. Leaving the door behind takes courage and commitment, and it is not for the fearful and the timid. But the transformation that awaits you 
as you explore and discover this spiritual landscape of God is beyond your wildest dreams. I guarantee it. In order to leave this door of salvation behind and begin this journey of sanctification, of spiritual transformation, to do this, you must first set your mind. Yes, you have the ability within you to set your mind, to set your intention, to become resolute in your desire to follow Christ. As our reading today says, we need to set our mind on God and not on the world. As Colossians 3.2 says, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Or as it says in Romans 5, uh, sorry, chapter 8, verses 5 through 8, for those who are in accord with the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are in accord with the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Peter responded, out of the flesh, and it did not please Jesus. So, we have a choice. We can set our mind on the world, on the flesh, or we can set our mind on God, on the Spirit. And just so you know, the default position is having our minds set on the flesh. In other words, if you are not intentional in setting your mind on God, on the Spirit, on the things above, then by default, your mind is set on the things below. So, the first step is set your mind on God. Set your intention to follow God. Say to yourself, I am going to commit to follow Jesus Christ, and everything I do will be committed to that path. That's what it means to set your intention, to be resolute in your commitment to follow Jesus. Set your mind. Set your heart. Set your commitment to follow Jesus. That's the first step. The second step follows from this one. Spend time with God every day in prayer and Bible study. That's right. Gather with fellow Christians who have also set their mind to follow Christ. Engage in spiritual practices that nourish you, whether it be singing songs of praise, chanting the Psalms, practicing meditation and yoga, volunteering for service to others, practicing gratitude for all you have, walking the labyrinth, engaging in social justice, taking pilgrimages, practicing ceremonies or rituals, journaling, memorizing scripture. There are all kinds of spiritual practice available to you, and I know with just a little bit of effort on your part, you will find one or two, three or four, or however many, that will work well with you. There are two steps we need to follow. One, setting your mind on God instead of the things of the world. Setting your mind on the spirit instead of on the flesh. That prayer practice will also help you with that because it makes you aware of the places in which you fall short in the flesh and in lust. And so set your mind on God. That's the first step. Second, practice daily your spiritual practices. Then, with time and commitment, that's a huge, vast, beautiful landscape out there. It takes time to explore it all, to discover God is infinite, and God is rich in all that he is, and we simply need to dive into God and commit to that, and we will be blessed 
and we will grow. We will find sanctification. And with time and commitment and God's grace, which is always available to you and without which we will never grow spiritually, with time and commitment and God's grace, we will find ourselves slowly being transformed into a true follower of Jesus Christ so that wherever he goes, we will follow. We will become a mature Christian. As it says in Romans 12, 1 through 2, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. At this time, we are going to have our closing hymn, which is In the Cross of Christ, I Glory. Please feel free to stand. And then after that, we're going to have an invitation to ministry. Uh, Caitlin Zulink is going to come up and talk to you about the youth ministry. Good morning, Harmony Grove. My name is Caitlin Zulinke, and I'm the youth pastor here. I've been here for about six weeks now, and I have had such a joy um, meeting your youth and getting to spend some time with them on Zoom. I'm so thankful that they've showed up on Zoom um, to meet a stranger who's their new youth pastor. Um, we've had some fun on there. I want to just invite the rest of our youth who are part of our church to join us. Um, we are meeting on Zoom right now, um, and we will begin exploring what meeting in person looks like once we begin meeting in a couple weeks together as a church. Um, right now, we are having the fifth and seventh graders, fifth through seventh graders meet at 515 on Zoom, and then eighth through 12th graders are at six o'clock on Zoom. And if you would like those links, you can find them in the constant contact um, every week. Um, in youth group, we have just been getting to know each other and building relationship. And also, I just hope that I'm able to provide space for everyone to explore life together and explore what our faith means together. Um, I'm here because of the impact that my youth group growing up had on me. And so I, pr I hope to provide that same space to our youth together. Additionally, I want to invite any of you that are a part of our congregation, any parents, um, or adults in our congregation who would like to volunteer. I would love to have you all join us on Zoom or in person in any capacity that you would like. Um, if you want to, you can contact me again through that information that is in constant contact. My email and my phone number is in there. 
Again, I've had such a, a good time meeting our youth and spending time with them, and I hope that more of you, anyone 6th through 12th grade, will join us on Zoom and eventually in person. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Caitlin. So let's just, so Sundays at 5 o'clock, it's the 6th through 5th, 6th, 5th through 7th grade is from 5.15 to 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 8, 8 through 12. Okay, great. So that's every Sunday. Um, great. Uh, at this time, those who want to may please rise for the benediction. Please receive this benediction. Know that you are loved by God. Know that you have the power within you to follow God with his grace by simply setting your mind, setting your intention. Follow Jesus, and in that process, you too will be blessed, and then share that love with others. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. amen.